No more quizzes out there, right? I won't talk about the quiz, but uh, you will, when you get to the point where I have to say, you have to break the sentence. It's going to have to break out the question. So, you can not break the wall. It's going to have to break the wall, and then I will break them as soon as I start breaking. Time around, I just think. I think it's on, it's just my, my mic was a little tilted. So as soon as I grade them, I will let you know when they're graded. And I will put them out on the ninth floor for people to pick up. They'll be in alphabetical order face down. That's why I made you write your name in the back. So I can't think of an easy way to give them back without all kinds of other issues. So watch out for the email. Probably by midday tomorrow, you should get an email saying your quizzes are done, come pick them up and the solutions will be attached to that email. So let's talk about growth. We talked about cash flows. We're ready to make the transition into growth. Okay. So when we think about estimated growth, one of the things that I want to emphasize up front is there is this glorification of growth in markets. Growth is viewed as a good thing, not growing is viewed as a bad thing. And I want to kind of dispel that delusion. Growth can be good, growth can be bad, growth can be neutral, and here's why. Growth is a trade-off. When you decide to grow, the good news is your earnings and revenues are going to be much higher in the future. That's the good news. The bad news is you've got to invest money to get that growth. And not surprisingly, if you have to invest immense amounts of money to get a growth rate, that growth rate can very quickly turn against you. In fact, later I'll show you a, a graph that shows you what percentage of companies globally are having trouble creating value from growth. And it's an astonishingly high number. More companies destroy value growing than add value from growth. So I'd like to set up this process of talking about how do we estimate growth? How do we gauge whether it's going to increase value, decrease value, do nothing for that? So you've all picked companies. I'm going to assume you have, even if you haven't entered in the master spreadsheet. You're sitting down to make a judgment on what growth is going to be in the future. The most logical place to, to start, the most intuitive place is look at the past, right? When you're projecting growth for your company, well, look, what did it grow at last year, two years ago, three years ago, five years ago? That's called historical growth. We're going to start with that. And then we're going to show how bad it is as a predictor of future growth. But we're going to look at it anyway. The second thing you try to do, especially if this is the first time you're valuing a company or you haven't done this before, is you try to outsource your growth estimate. You know what I mean by outsource? You know how most appraisers get growth rates for their companies? Guess who they ask? The management of the company, how quickly will you grow? Terribly biased source. But the assumption is managers must know more about the company than I do. So if they tell me they're going to grow at 20%, I'm just going to take it and run with it. So we're going to look at managers' estimates of growth. And if many of you are valuing publicly traded companies, especially if they're high-profile companies, there are other people who are estimating growth for your company. You know who I'm talking about, right? You take Facebook, there are 50 equity research analysts projecting growth. And that growth rate is in the public domain. You can see what the expected growth in earnings per share is that analysts are projecting for your company. And part of you says, well, they must know more than I do. Therefore, their estimate of growth must be better than mine. So that's the second. The third way of thinking about growth is rather than look at history or look at analysts, you look at fundamentals. Here's what, here's what I mean by fundamentals. It's not in your power or my power to go around endowing companies with high growth, just because I like it. For a company to grow, it's got to do two things. One is it's got to reinvest money back in the business. In what? If it's a manufacturing company, land, building, equipment, machinery. If it's a technology company in R&D. If it's a user-based company in customer acquisition costs. And then you look at how well it's reinvested. How much are you reinvesting? How well are you reinvesting? In a sense, it 
says, rather than forecasting growth, why don't I forecast those fundamentals? Historical growth, analyst estimates of growth, and, and management estimates if need be, and, and what I'm going to call fundamental or intrinsic growth. So let's start with historical growth. You open up any data service, whether it's S&P Capital, like or Yahoo Finance, there's usually a growth rate that the service is estimated for your company. It looks like a fact, right? 15.33%, second decimal point. When you look at that growth rate though, remember it's an estimate, it's not a fact. And here's what, the growth rate you get for a company will depend on how you compute the growth rate. Sounds like inside statistics, but I'm gonna show you the difference between growth rates when you take an arithmetic average, just a simple average, as opposed to a compounded growth rate. It'll also depend on some people actually get fancy. They use regression models to predict growth. It's actually very close to what you get by using arithmetic or geometric averages. But there are multiple ways of estimating growth with the same data. Here's the second factor that drives what growth rate you get. When you look at a growth rate, it says between 2016 and 2021, or 2011. Have you ever wondered why a base year is picked? Why 2011? Why 2016? Why 2009? Yeah, it might be automatic, 10 years for some companies, but I'll give you one reason why people pick a base year. If you want a really high growth rate for your company, make 2020 the base year for your company. Do you know why? It was a terrible year for companies. Make 2009 a base year. You're saying that's game playing. People play games with historical growth rates all the time. So your period of growth matters, the starting point matters. And it also depends on growth in what? I've been awfully sloppy in saying growth rate. It could be growth in revenues, growth in EBITDA, growth in operating income, growth in net income, growth in earnings per share. And the numbers can be wildly different. And finally, when you think about historic growth rates, even if you trust that number, if you have a small company that's become a big company over the last five years, we think of how few subscribers Peloton had three years ago and how many it has today. Or take a company like you know, Airbnb and look at how much it's grown over the last five years. Even if that growth rate from the past is right, you've got to be careful about using it as your growth rate for the future because scaling up is hard to do. You're building off a much bigger base now than five years ago. And I'm going to use an absurd example to illustrate this point, but it'll kind of bring home how dangerous it is to take past growth rates and just project them out in the future. So lots of different things, and there's some mechanical issues with growth that I want to talk about when companies go from negative to positive earnings. How do you even compute a growth rate? So let's start with this contrast between arithmetic and geometric averages. I've taken, this is a very old example. It's Motorola between 94 and 99. I have four metrics, revenue, EBITDA, EBIT, actually there was net income and earnings per share. I have five metrics, but I'm showing you three because it's going to be sufficient to bring home the point I'm going to try to make. So I have revenues for the last you know, six years, growth rates of five, EBIT, EBIT. So I have five years of growth rates in each of these. I compute an arithmetic average. So just add up the five numbers divided by five. Let's take revenues. The arithmetic average growth rate is 7.08%. The geometric average is 6.82%. You remember how to compute geometric averages? What do I do? Anybody want to help me out? You need only two numbers to do the geometric average. Ending number, starting number, and you look at what the growth rate was between those two numbers. For revenues, that growth rate is 6.82%. You're saying, so it's pretty similar. For revenues, arithmetic average growth and geometric average growth are very close. Take a look at EBITDA. Arithmetic average growth is 10.89%. Geometric average growth is 5.39%. You can see the difference start to widen. You go to EBIT, arithmetic average growth rate is 42%, geometric average is 4%. If I showed you net income, it's going to get even wider and earnings per share, it's even wider. And there's a reason for that difference. See the standard deviation at the bottom? The larger the standard deviation in a set of numbers, the bigger the difference there will be between arithmetic averages and geometric averages. And think of what? What's the only condition where the two numbers will converge, the arithmetic and the geometric averages? What is to be true about the growth rate each year? If I get 8%, 8%, 8%, 8%, 8% every year, the arithmetic average is five, the geometric average is also going to be five. 
In other words, when the standard deviation is zero, the difference between the two numbers will disappear. The more volatile a number becomes, the more you've got to be careful about how you average. Makes you suspicious when people say, our growth rate over the last five years was 35%. Before you believe them, the question you've got to ask is, how do you compute the growth rate? Was it based on arithmetic averages or geometric averages? And if it's a volatile stream of numbers, that difference can be very wide. Any questions on the averaging approach? Now let's talk about one of those mechanical things that when I show you, you're gonna say, big deal, I, I know it when I see it. But I'm gonna tell you how this is going to contaminate growth rate calculations, especially when you're doing them for a lot of companies. Here's the way we compute growth rates. We take the earnings this year, we take the earnings last year. We divide the earnings this year by the earnings last year, and we subtract out one. So if my earnings this year is $2, my earnings last year was $1.50, two divided by 150 minus one is what, 33%. That's how we compute growth rates. Now I'm gonna give you an example of a company where this is going to give you really strange results. This was in, I was computing the earnings per share growth rate for Time Warner from 96 to 97. In 96, Time Warner reported an earnings per share of minus five cents. They lost money. In 97, their earnings per share was 25 cents. Before we look at growth rates, did Time Warner have a good year or a bad year? We're going from 96 to 97, going from minus five cents to plus 25 cents. That's good, good news, right? At least you're moving in the right direction. Compute growth rates the way we're taught to do them. You take the 25 cents this year, you divide by minus five cents in the denominator. You know what you're gonna get as your growth rate? Minus 600%. That's absurd, right? But mechanically you did everything right. It doesn't make any sense when you go from negative to positive, growth rates will start to give you strange looking numbers. Now, of course you can try to do ways of ways around the problem. One is to take a minus and make it a plus. You're saying that sounds, that looks much better. And then you can mathematically cover yourself. I use the absolute value of the earnings rather than, you know, the, than, the, than the actual number. My point is when you go from negative to positive, growth rates become not meaningful. It, not, in this case, you can see the problem unfolding in front of your eyes. I'll tell you when I ran into this the first time, when I first, first started collecting data on my website, I would compute the growth rate for every company by taking earnings this year, divided by earnings last year, minus one. So first time I did, I download 8,000 companies. I get the earnings this year, the earnings last year. I do the equation, I copy it down. And luckily I checked the numbers and I started noticing that every company that went from negative to positive, I was getting this really strange looking result. All it needed was an if statement in there, right? Basically say, if the earnings last year are not negative, compute the growth rate the way you do. If they are, just put NMF. They're not meaningful in there because it doesn't make any sense to compute a growth rate when you go from negative to positive. People still try to do it. In fact, I'll show you some of the ways that people try to come up with the number. One is to use the, app, the higher of the two numbers. Take minus five plus 25, Instead of dividing by last year's earnings per share, use the higher. It makes completely no sense, but at least the percentage looks more meaningful. Some people use the absolute value of earnings, in which case you go from minus 600% to plus 600%. But this is just game playing. Ultimately, the only reason we compute growth rates is to project the future. And none of these approaches gives you a number that I can use for projecting the future. So bottom line, if you have a company that's gone from negative earnings to positive earnings, the growth rate becomes not meaningful. No matter what services say about this company, don't use that growth rate as a basis for any future projections. Any questions on that mechanical side to growth rates? Let's talk about the problem scaling. You heard of Callaway Golf? A company that came out of nowhere in the 1990s. In fact, the most famous product is anybody? Any golf fans? The Big Bertha, which is one of the, you know, they came out with this club. It took off like a rocket. So this was an assessment of growth that was making for Callaway Golf in 1996. And you can see how well it's done, right? Its net profit has gone from 1.8 million to 123.3 million over five years. <laughs> 
the compounded average growth rate is 102%. So this isn't even an arithmetic average. I'm not playing games with it. This is the geometric average, 102%. Take that as a fact. Over the last five years, Callaway Golf has done really well. It's grown 102% a year. I've seen people just take historical growth and apply it into the future. Let's do that here. Let's take the 102% growth rate and let it be the growth rate for the next five years. Take a look at what happens to my net income by the time I get to 2001. In five years, my net income goes from 122 million to 4.1 billion. We underestimate the effect of compounding. You'll show up when you sit down to value your company, say, I'm gonna use a 20% revenue growth for the next 10 years. I'm not gonna contest you on it, but take a look at how much your revenues will be 10 years from now with a 20% growth rate. Is the market big enough to carry a company with $100 billion in revenue if the entire market is only $70 billion? I've seen people value Netflix with $600 billion in revenues because they projected growth rates based on the last five years for the... As a company gets bigger, even if the historical growth rate is a fact, be cautious about projecting that growth rate because you now have a much bigger base on which you have to grow. That's historical growth and you can already see why different services will report different growth rates for the same company. My advice is don't trust any of these growth rates. Compute them yourself. This isn't rocket science. We have the earnings every year for the last five years. You can do this yourself. You don't need S&P capital, like you say, telling you this is the compounded annual growth rate for the last five years. They might be right, but why take them at their word? So now let's talk about analysts. I said early in this class that, that equity research analysts fall into two groups. Your buy side analysts, these are the people who work at Fidelity and State Street and the mutual funds, and their research is primarily for internal consumption for their portfolio managers. You never see them mentioned in the papers because they don't have a high profile. And then your sell side analysts who work at Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, and they put buy and sell recommendations and they're on CNBC pushing their recommendations. I told you a company like Facebook, I think has like 75 sell-side equity research analysts tracking. And if you think about how sell-side equity research is structured, equity research analysts are given about 15, maybe 20 companies to follow. And they spend all of their days and nights sometimes tracking these companies for their entire lifetimes. So let's start with an easy question. Do they spend more time on the company you and I are valuing than we do? Absolutely. And they also spend a huge amount of the time estimating earnings. It's not valuing companies, but estimating earnings. In fact, about half the time is estimating earnings next quarter. That becomes the game. What will the earnings per share be next quarter? Because if you can get that right, you can make money trading on that expectation. So let's bring it all together. Equity research analysts spend insane amounts of time tracking these companies. They spend all of their time forecasting earnings for the future. And when they forecast growth rates, your assumption is they must know something that we don't, right? They bring in all this additional stuff. They talk to the managers. They've tracked these companies for 30 years. They must know something that we don't. Well, it's reasonable, right, to believe that. But let's start with a question. Sell side equity research analysts project growth and earnings for your company. You can look them up on IBES, on Yahoo Finance, on S&P Capital, like your five-year growth rates. How good are these growth rates? in predicting actual growth. There are actually studies that have looked at this question. And here's the test they run. They take the earnings per share projected by sell-side equity research analysts. So this brings in everything that analysts know, all that information, all that you know, informal you know, news that they get from the company. And they compare it with the time series forecast. You know what a time series forecast says? It takes past earnings, puts it into a computer, projects out. So think of it as a completely uninformed forecast. So you got the analyst forecast with all of the richness of information they presumably have, and you got a time series forecast. I'll start with the good news. The analyst forecasts are generally more precise than time series models. So notice the forecast error, the lower that number, the more precise your forecast. So the good news is analyst forecasts are better than time series models. But here's the bad news. If you look at the difference, 
it's astonishingly small. All these millions of dollars we're spending on cell side equity research. And you look at the forecast error, it's not that much smaller than using a time series model. In fact, if you break it down further, the forecast error tends to get larger if you look at longer term periods. So basically the advantage they have is greatest for the next quarter. If you look at a one-year forecast or a five-year forecast, the five-year forecasts become almost notes. So you'd see five-year forecast and earnings for your company from analysts, might as well just throw it out. There's really no information there. It turns out that the forecast error tends to, the, the advantage they bring is greater for bigger firms, I'm sorry, for smaller firms than bigger firms, which makes sense, right? Because they have more access to information you don't have. And finally, if you look at the advantage they have, it's, it's greater at the industry level. They're better at forecasting earnings for an entire industry than they are for individual companies. The bottom line is all this time, all this money that analysts are spending on forecasts, and there doesn't seem to be much there. In fact, about uh, probably 15 years ago, I was invited to give a talk to sell side equity research analysts at a conference in New York City. And I don't think they're gonna invite me back on this particular front again, because I came in with this presentation. What do you guys do? And why isn't it showing up as better forecast? And here's what the response was. It's not us. This is all equity research analysts, but the good ones forecast. We have a lot of bad analysts. They're in Florida. They, you, it's very convenient. You consign them to other parts of the country because New York sells out equity research analysts at the top of the heap. They might. I said, okay. So maybe the best of these analysts must do a better, better job forecasting. <laughs> you think, how the heck are we going to know who the best equity research analysts are? For 40 years, institutional investor has helped us out on that front. You know how football, they have all American teams that they call as football. They pick the best players in each position. Institutional investor for 40 years has been looking at sell side equity research and taking each sector and picking an all America analyst in that sector, supposedly the very best analyst. If you're a sell side equity research analyst and you get that attach your name, all American analysts, you're, you've, you've made it. Basically, you're among the very best. So I said, okay, the very best analysts are who I should be tracking. Let's see how well those all American analysts do at forecasting earnings. They must be much better than the rest of us, right? And, there's a, and there are papers that look at it. And there's a very interesting phenomenon that these papers have. In the year before, these equity research analysts were picked as all American analysts, their forecasts were actually a little worse than the average analyst. What does that tell you? How well you forecast earnings doesn't even fit into the criteria that's used to pick the very best analysts. You know what, what um, institutional investor basis that all American analysts choice are? It's how high your profile is. It's a vote, basically people vote. And if they've never heard of you, they're not going to vote for you. So guess who shows up? People are on CNBC all the time. People whose name is reported in the Wall Street Journal. So the year before they become all American analysts, their forecasts are actually worse. And then something magical happens. They become all American analysts and the year after they become all American analysts, their forecasts actually become a little better than average. This shows you the value of self-esteem, right? Maybe you become an all-American analyst. You think more of yourself, your forecast. What do you think is happening? I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with self-esteem. What happens after you become an all-American analyst that makes your forecast better than they used to be? Is it dead? But remember, these are earnings forecasts, right? So it's not even the recommendation effect. The recommendation effect, you, you're absolutely right. But your earnings forecasts, basically reflect what you're projecting as earnings. So it can't be people following you. What, what can make your earnings forecast better? Leaks from the company, right? You're Joe Brown, no name equity research analyst. You call a company, I'm Joe Brown. I'm the guy hangs up. Next year you call, I'm Joe Brown, all America analyst. Put right through to the CFO. Access improves. I know that the SEC says no inside information, but let's face it. There are informal ways of letting analysts know that you're doing better than expected or worse than expected. So if you look at earnings forecasts, the best analysts are not that much better at forecasting earnings than the average analyst. It is true 
that the recommendations that these analysts make, and this was Dan's point, have a much bigger impact. Why? Because if you're an all-America analyst, you put a buy recommendation, the Wall Street Journal picks it up. There are more people tracking you, more people following you. But here again, there is a divide. When these analysts for, put out a buy recommendation, the stock price goes up about 3%. And almost all of it disappears in the weeks after. It's completely temporary. So buy recommendations become almost useless, even for these analysts. But when they put out a sell recommendation, the drop is about 4.75% on the, on the recommendation, and it continues to go down in the weeks after. In general, sell recommendations seem to have a much more lasting impact on stock prices than buy recommendations. Why do you think that is? Well, remember we talked about the, the ratio of buy to sell recommendations is like nine to one. So sell recommendations are extraordinarily rare, right? When an equity research analyst puts out a sell recommendation, either something very bad is happening at the company that you haven't found out yet. So in other words, if there is information, it's in the sell recommendations, not the buy recommendations, even among the very best analysts. So I've been thinking for a long time because I know a lot of people who take this class have become sell side equity research analysts. There are at least three major investment banks where the head of equity research is actually Stern MBA who's taken this class. So I have a very personal stake in this, this argument of what the heck is happening here? Why isn't all this brain power and all this work and all this data leading to better forecasts? And I have a few hypotheses as to why sell side equity research is so broken. And I think it's broken. I think it, unless they fix it, I mean, sell-side equity research now is smaller than it was 20 years ago. And it's going to get even smaller because people just don't trust the recommendations. So here are five possible hypotheses. I can't prove any of them, but if, you're, if you worked in sell-side equity research or you know somebody works in sell-side equity research, test them out. The first is what I call tunnel vision. Remember what I said, your job becomes a sell-side equity research analyst. If it is to follow technology companies, it's a subset of technology companies, application software companies. And all you do is track 15 application software companies. Your entire life becomes those 15 companies. You forget that there's a world out there and a market out there because you're so focused on these 15 companies. If all the companies in your sector trade at 50 times revenues, a company that trades at 30 times revenues looks cheap to you because your frame of reference has been set by looking at just these companies. There's a reason all those dot-com analysts in the late 90s didn't notice that you were paying too much because they were comparing what you were paying to other dot-com companies. Tunnel vision. Is there a fix to it? Yes. I think sell-side equity, buy-side analysts don't have this tunnel vision because they often have to cover 200 companies in different businesses. I think we need to get at least a mix of businesses going and let sell-side equity research analysts at least be aware of the rest of the market and bring it into their recommendations. Second, a lot of lemming items. One of the things that sell-side equity research analysts often do is, I told you they forecast earnings and then they'll revise their earnings estimates up or down. The next time you read in the Wall Street Journal that somebody's revised earnings for Tesla up for the next quarter, Keep your eyes on the news for the next 24 to 48 hours. Because you know what you're going to see? A lot of other analysts tracking Tesla also revising their earnings upwards. There's a lot of, nobody wants to be left out. Everybody wants to be part of the crowd. Third, there's a version of Stockholm syndrome, which is you track these 15 companies. Remember your job as a sell side equity research analyst is like being a journalist who tracks politicians. Right? You're supposed to ask the tough questions. You're supposed to keep them honest. You're supposed to put recommendations based on the research that you do. But you've spent 30 years tracking these, 50, these 15 companies. You become really close with the management of the company. And after a while, you're not sure whether your job is to ask questions of the company or to protect the company from other people asking questions. If you get a chance, sit in on it. You know, when, when, uh, when earnings reports come out, the earnings call is actually carried live. You can listen to the CEO, CFO, present the earnings number, and you can listen to the analysts ask questions. 
sitting on the Tesla earnings call. And you're going to see exactly what I mean about Stockholm Syndrome, which is these guys have become so close to the company that they're incapable of asking tough questions. Factor phobia, I mean, a lot of equity research analysts, you're spinning a story. I'm a great believer in stories, but stories connected numbers. A lot of equity research reports are like reading a Charles Dickens novel. There's no number in sight and big stories. And finally, less of a problem than it used to be, but it continues to be a problem. There are sell side equity research analysts. Where do you work? You work in an investment bank, you know, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, or JP Morgan. And let's face it, you are a cost center. You, you see why you're a cost center? Because these banks don't charge money for the sell side equity research. You're doing, you're spending all this money turning out the equity research. So you're saying, why are they doing it? They're doing it because they hope the people who use this research will then trade through the bank or use the bank for other things. So when Morgan Stanley's equity research department puts out a sell side equity research report in a company, remember that company has other business with the bank. I know there's a Chinese wall, presumably between equity research and everything else. But the reality is you put a sell recommendation, you're gonna hear from people. You're gonna hear from the investment banking side. So how could you do that? We've got this big deal coming. At any point in time, it's not, it's not clear what role you're playing. Are you playing the role of an equity research analyst asking tough questions about the company and how good is it in an investment? Are you playing the role of a salesperson for the investment bank? where your equity research is actually pulling companies in. 20 years ago, investment banks were actually sued because of this conflict of interest. Elliot Spitzer made his name. He later on went on to become governor of New York and then bad things happened to him, but bad things seem to happen to governors of New York for whatever reason. But he made his name on this issue. Presumably he claimed he'd solved the problem, but the problem is unsolvable if you think about it, right? Because as long as you're a cost center, how the heck does an investment bank make money off sell-side equity research unless it gets other business? And the minute you open that door, this Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde phenomenon plays out. So here are my propositions about, about analyst forecasts. First, there's far less private information. We assume that analysts have access to all this information that you and I don't. Let go of that. In the US at least, their access to information is very similar to yours. You're, they're looking at the same 10 Ks. In fact, they're probably using S&P capital like you, just like you are for pulling up numbers in the company. Because the SEC has cracked down. It used to be that companies could let out hints to analysts. That's illegal now. And most companies are very careful about what they can reveal. So there's far less private information in analyst forecasts than you think there is. Second, the biggest source of private information when there is private information is the management of the company through hints or whatever little dribbles of information. You're saying, what's the big deal? They know more about, but they are biased. This is like a journalist who gets too close to his or her source. At some point in time, you can't burn your source. You're creating bias in your recommendations as well. In fact, that can explain a lot of things. First is why there are more buy recommendations than sell recommendations. You don't want to burn your source. Why there's so much correlation across analysts. They're leaking the information to all of them at the same time. And finally, you can see why all American analysts become so much better after they're tagged as all American analysts. So here's the bottom line. When you sit down to value a company, look up that growth rate that analysts are forecasting for your company. But don't get obsessed with that growth rate. If you come up with a growth rate different from what analysts are forecasting, ask the question, did I miss something? Are they seeing things that I'm not seeing? And if the answer is no, after you know, three days of research, move on, use your growth rate, not the analyst forecast. And remember the earnings growth rate you're going to see from analysts is a growth rate in earnings per share. It's not a growth rate in revenues. It's not a growth rate in operating income. It's not even a growth rate in net income. It's a growth rate in earnings per share, which will always be much higher than the growth rates as you go up the income statement. You're valuing a company by trying to forecast growth and revenues. And I can't think of a single company where growth and earnings per share and growth and revenues will be interchangeable. Any questions on analysts, growth rates and earnings forecasts? 
So let's talk about the third way of estimating growth. Now it's called intrinsic growth. It's got a fancy name, but it's pure algebra. To understand how you come up with this growth rate, let's take a very simple example. Let's assume you have a company that has a billion dollars invest in existing projects and it's making a 12% return on those projects. So 12% of a billion is 120 million. So right now, this company is making $120 million. If this company doesn't invest an extra dollar, just basically stays at the existing capital invested and continues to earn the same return in perpetuity, you know what its growth rate is going to be, right? Same capital, same return on capital. Your income is going to stay stuck at 120 million. So if a company does not add to its investment base and does not improve its return on capital, it cannot grow. Everybody agree with that algebraically? So how can it grow? Well, one thing it can do is it can add to that investment. It can make new investments. If it adds $100 million in new projects and makes 12% of those projects as well, mathematically, you're going to see that the earnings next period are going to be $132 million, $12 million higher than they were this year. But it's coming from the fact that you're adding to your investment base and earning the same return on capital. On, the, on those additions. If you take that growth rate, the 12 million, and you break it out, you can actually take the 100 million you invest back in the company and divide by the 120 million, which is your earnings. That's how much you reinvest. You invest, reinvested 83.33%. You made a 12% return on it. 83.33% times 12% gives me a 10% growth rate, which is exactly what I saw in the most recent year. All I'm doing is algebraically, I'm looking at the change in earnings. So where did that come from? It came from improving my investment base. I'm going to convert that into reinvestment rate. And what kind of return I made on that investment. Growth rates, if you have stable returns on equity and capital, can come from only growing your investment base, which is what reinvestment is. So one way to grow, especially for the long term, is to add to your investment base, make reinvestments, and maintain your return on capital. There is another way you can grow. And at least in the short term, this is so much less pay. If you can take your existing investment base and earn a higher return on capital, instead of 12%, if you could earn 13% on not just your existing projects, but your new projects, you're going to get a bump up in your growth rate. Let's call this efficiency growth. There are only two ways you can grow. You can have investment growth by adding new projects or efficiency growth by taking your existing projects and trying to extract higher returns from them. Every way of growing has to fall into one of those two buckets. So when you think about fundamental growth, you're trying to estimate two numbers. How much is my company reinvesting and how well is it reinvesting? You're saying, how am I going to measure that? It depends on what you're trying to forecast growth. If you're trying to grow, forecast growth in earnings per share, the ultimate equity earnings number, how much you reinvest is going to be captured by what percentage of your net income you don't pay out. So the retention ratio. So if you're paying out 40% of your net income in dividends, 60% gets retained. And how well you're going to, how well you're investing is captured by your return on equity. What you make is net income on the equity you invest back in the projects. This is the oldest sustainable growth equation. Retention ratio times return on equity is your expected growth in earnings per share. It's got its limits, and we'll talk about its limits. But if you're forecasting growth in earnings per share, look at the retention ratio, look at the return on equity, multiply the two, you got the expected growth rate. If you are forecasting growth in net income from just operating assets, your calculations are going to be slightly different because. Retention ratio just assumes dividend, whatever's not paid out in dividends gets reinvested back in the company, right? But that's not technically true. You could, not, you could hold back money, but it'll end up as an increase in your cash balance. So the second approach you say, I don't care what the company is retaining. I want to see how much it's actually putting into projects. Say, so how am I going to know that? Well, we already have a measure of what companies are reinvesting, right? Look at the net capex, look at the change in working capital. And if you have debt payments in the company or, or debt coming in, uh, you look at how much of your reinvestment comes from equity. Remember that free cash or equity component where you calculated how much equity investors invest? So the second approach, rather than trusting companies' retention ratio, you look at what they're actually investing in projects. 
let's call that an equity reinvestment rate. So you have $100 in net income, how much of that $100 goes back into the company? Yep. So if you start investing in another company, Stay there. As long as the return, if the return on equity changes, all bets are off. We'll have to talk about how to modify this. So if the other business they're investing has the same return on equity, it'll fly. You can use this. But if the return on equity changes, there'll be a second component to grow, either positive or negative, depending on whether that return on equity is lower or higher than your current return. On equity. There's a reason why Apple and Google are so reluctant to go to new businesses. You know what that reason is? They're incredibly spoiled. What's the return equity they make on their existing projects? Immense. We can talk about whether it's 50% or 60% or 75%, but it's immense. There is no manufacturing business out there on which you're going to make 50, 60, or 75%. Doesn't mean they're bad investments, but they will never measure up to the return equity you have on your existing investments. Tech companies have a really tough time going into other businesses because they look at every other business. That looks like a bad business. It makes only a 30% return on equity. When you make 50%, 30% looks bad. And finally, if you're looking at the entire operating income, reinvestment rate becomes net capex plus change in non-cash working capital, that total amount, divided by the after-tax operating income. So how much you reinvest is going to vary depending on whether you're looking at earnings per share, net income, or operating income. How well you're reinvesting is also going to shift. With earnings per share, it's pure return equity, traditional return equity. When you're looking at non-cash fraud, the net income from non from operating assets, mild variation. Instead of taking the entire net income, you subtract from it the income you made from your cash holdings, which is close to zero now, but there are periods when you could make interest income on cash. You take that out of the net income. Why? Because in the denominator, rather than look at the entire book value equity, you look at the book value equity net of cash because you're looking at the equity invested in operating projects. So think of that as non-cash return on equity. And finally, if you're looking at operating income, you look at return on capital. After tax operating income divided by book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. Let me emphasize right here that this is the only place in finance where we use book values. And we compute returns in equity and returns in capital. We never use book values when you do cost of capital, levered betas. This is the only place where we use book values because we're trying to get a measure of what's invested in the project rather than what the market value of the project is. It remains the only place. So let me at least start on a couple of the easiest scenarios. As I said, when you're trying to forecast growth in earnings per share, you take retention ratio times return equity. And if your return equity is going to stay stable, this then becomes your growth in earnings per share in the long term. But there's a limit to this growth, right? What's the highest retention ratio you can have as a company? 100%, you can't retain. So retention ratio is capped at 100%. Already you can see the implication, right? If the retention ratio cannot exceed one, in the long term, the growth in earnings per share for a company cannot exceed its return on equity. So if you have an 8% return equity in your business and you come in and say, I'd like to have 20% growth in earnings per share. I say, no, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. You cannot get that kind of growth in earnings per share. You can get growth in net income by expanding your investment base, issuing new shares. So when you're looking at earnings per share, it's retention ratio times return equity. So the highest number of retention ratio can be is 100%, right? What's the lowest number you can have? Zero. Your retention ratio can't be negative. It can't be more than 100%. You think, so what? When I go show you non-cash return equity, both those constraints will be removed. I can reinvest more than 100% of my net income by raising fresh equity, or I can return cash to the firm and make the company smaller, end up with an equity reinvestment rate that's less than zero. So here's an example, very simplistic example. And it tends to work pretty well in this sector, and you're going to see why. Let's say you're, you have to estimate the expected growth in earnings per share for a bank. I know some of you are valuing banks. I know we live in times where return on equity in banks is unstable, but let's say you assume the return on equity is predictable and stable. This is, a, this is actually a growth rate that I projected for Wells Fargo a few months before the September 2008 meltdown. The return on equity I got for Wells Fargo was 17.56% net income divided by book equity. 
its retention ratio was 45.37%. So that's just basically whatever was not paid out. So both those calculations are pretty trivial calculations. If I make the assumption that the company can maintain this return on equity and retention ratio for the next five years, its expected growth rate is going to become retention ratio times return equity, 7.97%. In fact, in June of uh, 2008, I think I valued Wells Fargo with that growth rate. Then, of course, you got September of 2008, the world melts down. Regulatory authorities decide that banks are undercapitalized. They're still wrestling with that, right? Are banks correctly capitalized? So let's say no new numbers have come out about Wells Fargo. You're still waiting for the next financial statement. Let's focus on just the retention ratio and return equity. The regulators announced that because you're now in a crisis and they've learned that banks don't have enough capital, they're going to raise the regulatory capital requirements at all banks by 30%. How is this going to play out when you think about growth rate? So let's say the net income stays the same. The dividend stays. So basically, the numbers for the bank haven't changed. Let's say they haven't changed. How does this change in regulatory capital play out in that growth rate? What does what 30% is more regulatory capital mean? You got to go out and raise fresh equity. Your book equity will, because regulatory capital and book equity are very, very closely tied together. You'll have to raise your book equity by about 30%, right? Same net income, but a bigger book equity, that 17.56% return in equity drops to about 13.9%. You can work out the math, basically take 17.56%, but then add on 30% to the denominator. Your return equity, even if nothing changes, is 13.91%. And if this bank continues to pay the dividends that it did, its expected growth rate is going to drop to about 6% with nothing changing. You're going to get lower growth rates for financial service companies if regulatory capital goes up. It's something we've been struggling with for the last decade is the regulatory capital routes keep shifting. And every time they shift, they affect our future return in equity at these firms. And by doing so, they affect the growth rate. Now, it's true that Wells Fargo could cut dividends and reinvest more now. because, they, But if they do that, they're going to have a lower retention ratio. There's no easy way out of this. right? One way or the other, the value of every bank is going to be impacted by this change. So I'm going to stop there, and when we come back, we're going to talk about you know, ways in which you can pump up your return equity and how it plays out in non-financial service companies. Yeah. Uh, we take a pretty, suppose, like, um, this is a question we want to ask you. We've all collected the building uh, income for the most recent 12 months. Yes. Uh, you add that. So we take that. Correct. Yeah. But then we take the TV of the future three cash flows and divide by three. Why are we putting depreciation in this year? The technically, you should be doing this every year. You should take the present value right. basis from the previous year right. and divide by three. Correct. Yeah. To do that, though, you've got to go back to the previous year. We, we, we could go get it, but it's a pain in the neck. But technically, that's how you should be doing it. The effect of using this year's number is so small that it's, 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 so it's an approximation. Right? It's an approximation. But tell people if you had to do it right, you use the previous year's present value. Got it. That makes that's sense. It. And we would not be drawing out the lease schedule because so fast we do on margin basis. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah, because uh, once you put it into the debt ratio, remember from this point on, your debt ratio is going to drive because so as your company grows, you're actually implicitly assuming that these commitments will grow at whatever your growth is, right? Because the debt ratio stays. So that's the thing about putting everything into a base year and getting it nailed down. Because once you've done that, when you grow the company, everything goes with it. So you're not forecasting the least commitments in the future, but you're implicitly assuming that even retail firm growing at 30% a year. Your lease commitments are also growing at 30% here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That's okay. I can, I'll copy that. That's fine. That's okay. What about value income where you have business services where you don't have capital or your capacity taken for? Well, then you got to capitalize those expenses, right? So, like technology. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, basically, it'll be the recruiting and training expenses will become the equivalent of capex. Yeah. 
because without it, you're going to end up with sky high returns in equity. Your growth rate might still be the same because yeah. you end up with a very low reinvestment rate, but a sky high return in equity, right? Because you're not capitalizing. But for a more realistic estimate, especially what you want to forecast the future, you've got to make a judgment of how much of that expense is really capital expense. So like consulting firm, like they yeah. hire another 50 employees? It's not the hiring, because the hiring, the actual expense you're paying employees is often an operating yes, expense, right? Yeah. But some of what you pay each employee is designed not so much to reward you for what business you bring in the rest year, but to build you up as part of the unit capital. Mm -hmm. Now, in some firms like McKinsey, that's a big chunk. Firms like the accounting firms, it's terrible because that's why they lose so many people is they pay barely basically operating expenses. There's no additional. Incentive. So when you take a company like McKinsey or Goldman Sachs and you think about why they're spending so much on their employees and training and recruiting and this additional stuff they give them, it's essentially their capex. Okay. Yeah, it's very good. And then just wait to miss yeah. It forces you to think about a business yeah. and ask tough questions, yeah. right? Because every business wants to grow. Consulting firms say we're going to grow 50% a year. The questions that I ask them are that will require a lot more consulting. Yeah. How much are you planning to spend and build up on it? Because it might turn out that the additional revenue that these 50 consultants is actually less than all the money you've got to spend to hire those 50 consultants, to keep them on board, pay the additional bonus. So I think that that's why you do it, is to force the company to explain where it was. Yeah, and I was going to mention one thing that you know, was looking at the past. Um, yeah. That could be well. Because what you're getting then is relevant for consulting firm are not very fair, right? Because it's yeah. after capex. So you're trying to figure out what did you actually make on your consulting engagements? And how much of your expenses are really designed for even with the client, right? Often you're doing other services for a client that you don't get paid for because you want that client to come back. Mm -hmm. You could actually argue that a portion of your expenses in service and client has nothing to do with what the client asks you right now, but because you want to build that client up in the long term. Because it then makes consulting firms make a deal, which is if you don't do this, the way the country puts it for higher profits is they can cut all those other benefits that you're trying to do, right? They're for higher up. But in the process, what have they done? They've undercut their potential to do yeah. so because those clients are too pretty because they feel no obligation to stay. Yeah, they always get and that's going to happen anytime you expect things that shouldn't be expected. Because the easy way for that company now to put higher earnings is to cut our new expenses, mm -hmm. cut customer acquisition costs. Cut recruiting and training expenses because it throws higher earnings for everyone. Yeah. So the market rewards them for higher earnings without realizing that this company is undercut its basically the future to get there. No, I'm okay. Thank you. I'll put in my Excel spreadsheet. I have a hard Excel spreadsheet in my hard drive. I'll send it to you. And I told Kushala Gold, I don't know whether Brightspace allows you to upload the entire Excel spreadsheet because they have different formats. Albert, which is where you download the roster, they don't talk to each other. So you might actually have to physically enter the grade, but they'll be in alphabetical order. So you just have to make sure you don't get off by a name or something. Yeah. So just, yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll be 15 minutes, sir. So, yeah. okay.
<laughs> yeah, that was, I, I, I was trying to use it. Your company? All right, so, so all right. 
Yeah. 